In Ceramics 2, you finally get to use the Cone 6 High Fire Glazes. Uh, those glazes are a lot of fun, although application in this studio is very similar to how you apply your low fire glazes, the surface comes out completely different. Again, we fire our high fire to cone six. So this year we have all of our high fire glazes measured out into little cups for you, but um, most years we all share large containers of the glaze. We do brush apply all of our glazes. I spent years trying to get the dipping system going, but it tended to not work well with so many kids using them. So I want to show you how to figure out what glazes you want to use first and foremost. Um, Amico does have a great web page that shows you samples of the glazes that they carry. We do not have every single Amico Cone 6 glaze. That would be virtually impossible in the high school setting. But you can go ahead and purchase some additional glazes yourself. Something that you want to be aware of is not all glazes are dinnerware safe. So you do want to read and figure out if the glaze is safe for food to touch the surface. Do not attempt to coat a dinnerware safe glaze over a non-dinnerware safe glaze. That would still deem that surface not dinnerware safe. So please be careful about that. I have a rule that I do not allow glazes that are not dinnerware safe to touch any ceramic forms that I'm going to be eating off of or drinking out of. Most of the glazes that we have, with the exception of a couple, are food safe, but you wanna make sure that you check the labels and the website to make sure you understand whether or not it is food safe. So if you go to amico.com, you will see that the high fire cone six glazes are under glazes, under glazes. You can just click on high fire glazes, and there are several categories of high fire glazes. We have glazes that are in each of these categories. So I'm going to start with Potter's Choice. Uh, a lot of our glazes come from Potter's Choice. For example, we do have the Palladium Glaze, um, which is not food safe. But you can scroll down through and see what glazes are made. Again, we do not have all of these glazes. So make sure so that you're not disappointed. You check out what glazes we have first and then investigate what the color looks like. So this is a great little virtual test tile for you to see what the glaze looks like. Um, but then you can scroll down a little bit and you can see what a glaze looks like with, with one coat, two coats, three coats. Um, you can also see how a clay body, in other words, the clay color affects the glaze color through these little test tiles down here. And finally, these pages are awesome. This will show you the combination of glazes. For example, example, this is textured turquoise over blue midnight. So it's a great way to see how the layering works. One thing that is super awesome about cone six glazes is when they are layered, they are absolutely gorgeous because one color will break into another color. CB Clay Studio, we also have what we call Cascades, which are Cone 6. They are actually made by Mako, not Amico, and we most commonly use the Clear Cascade or the White Cascade. So the Cascade is to go on the rim of the form only. You can take it down a little bit, um, maybe like a half inch to an inch, depending upon the size of the form, but this stuff runs like crazy. But it's beautiful because it will um, expose the clay body color beneath, which is really awesome, especially if you're using the Brooklyn Red Stoneware or the Dark Brown Stoneware clay. These cascades look awesome. The white cascade also looks great, but the white stoneware, it causes the clay colors to break into more color variation, and you'll have kind of a white highlight on the rim, which is really beautiful. But again, do not ever, ever, ever place a cascade over the entire form or your piece will permanently fuse to my kiln shelf. So let's talk about glaze logs. Glaze logs are super important. I'm going to go a little old school on you and talk to you about keeping a glaze log in your sketchbook. But there are a lot of ways to keep glaze logs. 
logs. I've had students keep their Glaze log on their Clay Studio Instagram account or just on the notes page in their cell phone. Whatever works for you, but you need to get in the habit of logging not only what glazes you're using, but the order of application and how many coats. The order of application does play a role in how the surface will look. So my old school technique, which I think works quite brilliantly, is using your sketchbook. So with ceramics too, we have these little clay buttons that we've created that we're going to turn into magnets, but they're also serve as test tiles. So if you remember, I had instructed you to please number the back. So you put your initial and a number. You can use either under glazes to number the back or you can carve right in the back. So then you'll see on my log, I have a note, glaze buttons. Then as I get to the relief, the adding clay to clay technique, I then sketch out the buttons because they're not numbered on the back. So you can see how this clay button design aligns with the sketch. So whenever you're glazing ceramic forms like mugs and vases, what I typically do in my glaze log is I write a little description, but then I also do a little sketch. So I remember exactly what form relates to what glaze. Because not all of us number the bottom of our pots as we make them. Some of you do though, in terms of knowing what order you created things. So when you're glazing, you want to, of course, have your glazes handy and your glaze brushes, also a bowl of water and a sponge to remove glaze from area where you do not want it applied. When you're applying a cone six glaze, you really do not want any more than three coats. If your glaze is too thick on the surface, you will get what's called pinholing. It's these tiny little holes, literally the size of the tip of a pin, and um, that will make your, your clay, your cup, your bowl, whatever, non-food safe. So you want to avoid pinholing. I actually prefer, for the most part, to use two coats. I do sometimes put three coats in some areas. The inconsistency of two to three coats tends to look really good on cone six glaze work. So I'm going to direct the camera down because we are going to get ready to glaze. Before you get started, make sure you remember to thoroughly shake, always keeping your finger on the lid of the glaze unless you want a little surprise. So when you're test glazing, you want to experiment with a lot of different glazes, but do a little bit at a time. So I'm going to start with doing a few of my test tiles with a seaweed base. So let's see, I'm gonna do numbers one, two, and three with a seaweed base, and then I'll do four, five, and six with an indigo float base. And then I will layer various glazes on top. So you wanna make sure that you are only glazing the area that will not touch the kiln shelf. So initially, your coat can be a little bit sloppy because we're gonna take a sponge and clean up those edges later. So I'm going to go ahead and apply a single coat to each one of these test tiles or clay buttons. And I'm going to do that for each glaze. Whenever you're changing colors and you're layering one color over the other, you want to make sure that you're allowing that glaze to dry completely so that it does not end up mixing on the brush and then when you re-dip, contaminating your glaze. Tile number two is dry with my first coat of seaweed and I have logged seaweed times one into my glaze log. I'm now ready to do a coat of indigo float as my second layer on this clay button and then I will allow that to dry and clean up the edge. I'm then going to take one of these indigo float buttons and do a layer of seaweed on top so that I can see the difference between putting seaweed on the top versus underneath indigo float. Now that I have my two coats of glaze on there I want to take the time to 
wipe the edge of this clay button to get that glaze edge very nice and neat. This is where the craftsmanship of glazing comes into play. You wanna make sure that where the glaze transitions to the clay body, that the edge is very nice and clean, and you wanna make sure that the bottom is free of any little bits of glaze. And now my test tile, my clay button, is ready to fire. Again, this has one coat of seaweed, one coat of indigo float, and it's test tile number two, and I have logged it in my sketchbook. After you are done glazing your work, you want to place it on the high fire glazeware only shelf. You do want to make sure that if you're glazing, whether it's flat forms or three dimensional forms, that there is a very clean bottom for me to place it onto the kiln shelf. If there is glaze on the base of the form, then I will not load your work. It will sit back on the high fire glaze shelf for all of eternity. So please make sure that the foot rings or the base of your form is clean.